We have a story tonight about our country and our sense of duty. Ruthie Zell has more of your stories of World War II. This is about a group of men who were called and who served and who fought their battles, military battles and social battles. This is, uh, this is, uh, from, uh, the basement of William uh, Washington's uh, University yeah, City home is a pictorial uh, tribute uh, to the pioneering uh, African Americans uh, of the U.S. Marine Corps. They call us the chosen few. Those chosen few are known as the Montfort Point uh, Marines, some of the most courageous servicemen you've probably never heard of. This is me here, and this is a friend of mine. William Washington became Private First Class Washington in 1943, shortly after the Marine Corps allowed African Americans into its ranks for the first time in 167 years. An executive order signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt made that change possible. The order was payback for support from African American voters in the northern states who helped Roosevelt win an unprecedented third term in office. And so, um, As a result, uh, Washington's life took an uh, unexpected turn at the age of 18 he when he to, went to uh, downtown St. Louis to register for the draft. And they had put me in the Navy. I didn't realize then that they had started up the Marine Corps, putting blacks in the Marine Corps. Okay. And so they had a quota. And so the quota system was uh, they'd take a few and train them, and then they'd take a few more and train them. Because they didn't, they didn't expect for us to be there too long anyhow. They expect for us to uh They didn't think it. you'd succeed? Oh, they, they didn't expect for us to succeed, I mean, because you never had no blacks in the Marine Corps. And so what happened, they needed a few to fill the quota for St. Louis or either this section. And so they picked me as, as one of them. Washington soon discovered that racial barriers in the Marines were very similar to those in civilian life. He was sent for training to a segregated recruit depot in North Carolina called Montfort Point. It was a satellite facility of nearby all-white Camp Lejeune. The very first Montford Point recruits were trained by officers from Lejeune. By the time Private Washington arrived for boot camp, drill sergeants were black. And then the black uh, drill instructors, they were worse on us than the, uh, than the white people were. Because they, they want you to make it, they go see that you made it. They were put through their paces and learned quickly how to swim and be agile in the water. They mastered hand-to-hand -hand combat, including martial arts, as well as all manner of weapons. But when granted time to leave the base, they'd be reminded of the Jim Crow laws of the day. It wasn't too much to do in Wilmington. Bill Washington recalled so, such an occasion uh, when he and some fellow Montford Pointers were returning from a and neighboring so, uh, town. We got ready to get on the bus. Yeah, the MPs and SPs, the SPs were there. And so they wouldn't let us on the bus. They let the white people on first. And so we started raising a little sand. The next day, I went and volunteered to get out of North Carolina. So I volunteered to go overseas. He ended up, as did all the black Marines who were deployed, in the Pacific. What they did with the black Marines, they made a defense battalion, and then they made what you call depots and ammunition. The depot and ammunition companies provided the last link in the critical supply line between U.S. factories and warehouses and the Marines fighting on the front lines. Though the black marines were initially considered mere stevedores, hauling ammunition and other supplies to the white troops, getting there often meant intense fighting on the battlegrounds of Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Peleliu, Okinawa, and Iwo Jima. They attach you to a division, or a division and everything. After everything is cooled down and everything, you go on back to, uh, you're, not, you're not part of that uh, anymore. But that separation from the rest of the Marine Corps and the hazardous duty made the Montford Point Marines all the more determined to prove themselves. The same combat support units that moved ammunition and supplies also evacuated the wounded. Especially down in Peleliu. They call them the Black Angels down there, you know, because they, uh, they were something else. The valor of these servicemen did not go unnoticed by the Marine establishment. Some were decorated for their bravery in battle. But the glass ceiling remained very low, and throughout the war, no African-American Marine could rise above the rank of sergeant. This here is the uh, baseball team overseas. Baseball was one way servicemen in the Pacific could unwind, and every outfit had a team. That's Washington in the center. 
A former pitcher in the Negro Leagues, he also pitched with the Marines. Even the 20th Air Force, the ones that fought the, that, that uh, flew the uh, B-29, now they had the best baseball team in the Pacific, I mean, because they had major league players and they had college players and things, you know. And uh, then nobody wanted to play us, I mean, even black, I mean, they finally, they finally played us, but they beat us two to one. Please join me in welcoming William Earl Washington. At the 2004 Marines birthday ball held by Fort Leonard Wood, the guest of honor was William Washington. Telling the story of the Montford Point Marines is important to Washington, who hopes that one day they are as well known as their aviation counterparts, the Tuskegee Airmen. He's the first officer of the Marine Corps. Much has changed since the days when Johnson and Washington served. The Marines became fully integrated and African Americans have risen to the highest levels of the Corps. It is Washington's hope that those younger generations understand the contributions and sacrifices made by their predecessors, men who, in spite of racial injustice, lived the Marine motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Even with the treatment you know, you, you still, still your country. This German gun fired Nazi propaganda, as well as Nazi high explosive. What would this man do? That's what this man wanted to know. We know now what he did. We know what they both did. And we know that they did it together. These are the Americans who did the job. They didn't think that America was perfect. They knew it wasn't. They didn't believe that prejudice doesn't exist, because it does. But they all agreed with Sergeant Joe Lewis when he said, there's nothing wrong with America that Hitler can fix. And they proved on the battlefields of Europe that there's nothing wrong with America that Americans can't fix. The battle of